This is the Checkly Kickstart. If you want to drop in the chat, if you are a current user of Checkly, if you've currently created Checkly monitors, and if you, um, if not, if you're currently using Playwright, that will help me make sure that we're well targeted here with the, the content that we're presenting. But um, we have a good bit to get through, so uh, no worries at all. We'll, we'll definitely have plenty of time for um, answering your questions. Just go do go ahead and drop those into the chat. and. Um, yeah, I, I did uh, e email most attendees to say, hey, what would you like to cover? And I think uh, Jan is here. Yep. Hi, Jan. Thank you so much for writing back and uh, definitely talking about um, creating screenshots and automating um, some, of our, some of our documentation of our testing. So fantastic. All right. So uh, <clears throat> to make sure that we're starting from this this high level, and again, apologies if you're like an experienced check the user, you're just trying to level up here. But just, just to start right at the top, right? Checkly is a pure synthetic monitor. And boy, synthetic monitoring sounds like quite a term, does it not? Sounds like, what, what the heck are we talking about? Um, we all know, right, our end-to-end -end tests that we've written since time memorial as part of our QA process, right? That try to test every component of a system by doing something that the user does, right? Something that the user does, which hits our backends, which hits our third-party services, which accurately simulates what people are trying to do with our service. Um, and synthetic monitoring is just using that end-to-end -end testing on a cadence, right? To really let us know if our service is up or down um, and, and get us that information. Okay, we had a, a ton of people join just last um, minute or so. Fantastic. Uh, recording of this will be available. You haven't missed anything. We're just diving in. Uh, I'm talking about Checkly. If you want to drop in the chat, uh, just to say if you're currently using Checkly or if you're currently using Playwright. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Checkly is pure synthetics. Pardon me, I'm going to cough. There we go. Nice, clear voice. Um, Checkly is pure synthetics, so there's no uh, monitoring agent to install on your system. There's no software helper package to install. The Checkly uh, a, a system comes in from the outside, just like one of your users does. Um, runs an end-to-end -end test, independent of your service, and... Uh, uh, does that check to then give you alerts or give you the status of your service from the outside. So we talk about requirements, right? Anyone should be able to run Checkly against a, 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 any service. Um, if that service requires authentic authentication, obviously you need the authentication details. So here's my little sketch of what we're talking about, right? The Checkly Synthetics Monitor is accessing from the outside, hitting your site or your API, right? And your service is, you know, uh, behind there supporting it. And it's the quality of that check that it's running that is going to uh, test all of the components, right? So... Uh, when I was just starting in observability, we had these things which were occasionally called like pingers or site monitors. And at their very first introduction, they really just checked for, does the service give us a 200 status uh, response, right? Hey, the page is available. Now we all know, right, that there are situations where it gives a 200 status response and then says, hey, service is unavailable. Hey, database error, right? So, you know, that wasn't sufficient for a lot of people's needs. So. As it evolved, people were able to do, oh, well, it searches for a piece of text on the page. But then, you know, every day people would come to us with requests for, uh, well, can I do something like hover over a button? Can I click a button? Can I enter text? Can I enter authentication details? No, you couldn't do that with the system at the time. Uh, Checkly supports the framework Playwright, which is backed by Microsoft's open source multi-platform project for complex user simulation and automation. And there should not be any user behavior that Playwright is not able to simulate. For me, I don't know, the one that always stands out to me is like um, going to some drop-down menu, hovering over something and checking that the color changes as expected or the text changes as expected. I'm like, yeah, it, it can simulate all of that, no problem. And we're not expected to like learn or run this code, I promise. But just an, another example that I thought was evocative of all you can do with Playwright is even things like file downloads and checking some of the content of file downloads, which is what this code snippet is doing, totally supported on uh, Playwright, within the Playwright framework. So Checkly allows this very deep level of um, simulation, automation of behavior, um, and including non-deterministic behavior, right, to simulate what that user is going to do.
So this was not intended as a as a, a, a you know a PowerPoint uh, a webinar, right? We're we're going to dive in and demo this. So let's go ahead and write our our first check. So let's start by taking a look at what it is that I want to uh, check. What what is the user behavior that I want to check? And one of the things you'll see from the playwright um, documentation and design documents, you'll really see like, hey, the goal is to simulate something that a user actually wants to do. So rather than saying, hey, I have this system, this database request or something, and I'm targeting that, we generally are going to start with, hey, the user wants to do this. So in my case, what I want to know that a user could do is I want to know that they know that they're welcome to edit our documentation on GitHub. So when they go to the main checklist site, when they go to the documentation and they scroll down, I want to see that there's this link here to GitHub. Maybe this link is implemented by an integration. And so, you know, I'm worried about it breaking. I, I suspect that it might. That is what I want to check that that, that that link is available. So how do we check that right now in the uh, uh, check we system. Oh, I have this code already written. Let's go ahead and delete that because we want to start fresh. In our check we system, right, we can hit the plus button and say we want to create a new browser check. And this wants to be a browser check, right, because we're, we're simulating browser behavior. And then it'll take us to this editor where we can enter in, right, the, the, the code, the playwright uh, code or playwright framework code for this check. And, you know, for some of us, this is going to be super comfortable. We've been in QA before. We've written end-to-end -end tests with Playwright. If so, go nuts. But for others of us, right, maybe this feels a little daunting, like, okay, I've got to go read this Playwright documentation. Here's the Playwright documentation over here. And, uh, you know, got a lot of syntax here, and, and I got to turn that into what I want to do. For myself, having been a lifelong developer, I really started from going and looking at these examples and sort of modifying them as needed. But there is a much more elegant way to do this for anybody to be able to write these checks. And just like anybody should be able to run the check lead, right, because it is an external monitor, anybody should be able to write new uh, uh, page tests, write an individual uh, uh, test, no problem. And so for that, I'm going to use the Playwright code gen. So over here, I have Visual Studio Code. I have a, another kind of empty test here without any content to it. And I want to generate the steps that we just we just said in, in code to simulate them. And what I've done is I have installed the Playwright uh, module for Visual Studio Code. You'll get a link to do this yourself, right, uh, after the talk. But um, and if you're watching this recording, that'll, that link will be down below there. But let's go ahead and record a new test. So when we hit that, it'll open up a new uh, browser for us. And let's see if I can split screen this a little bit. As we navigate around, oh, let me close the... We'll see, okay, let's go start by going to, it will just go ahead and generate the code that I need over here. So I'll go to developers, go to documentation, and then here's the link down here that I care about. And I want to assert, now it's time to really test something, right? I've, I've just gone ahead and done these automated actions, but now I want to go ahead and test something. So I'll assert visibility and then click on the thing that I want to assert is visible. And just like that, I, I should close this to make it stop generating. Just like that, I have the code that I need to go ahead and run this first check. So I'm going to grab all this, copy it, and come over to here. Now, um, I remember back in the day when AWS, like AWS Lambda, you were you were actually going through and highlighting and copying stuff from your code editor, from your IDE, and dropping it into a web interface. But this is just for the demo process that we're doing that. Uh, we can absolutely uh, both write and deploy all of our checks from the IDE. We will see a demonstration of that in a little bit. So so don't, yeah, don't worry that you're going to have to uh, 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 go back and forth and copy paste. That That's not part of the required process, I promise. But um yeah, we have these steps in here. Let's go ahead and run this and see it working. Now, for those of us who are, who are more familiar with Playwright, we might kind of be thinking like, well, what does this get us beyond Playwright? I know that if I have like the Playwright CLI, I can run 
a test, right, uh, as an example, and maybe even set up a script to run it with some consistency, we're actually seeing the very first example of the differentiation here or sort of how we take a playwright test and turn it into a monitor. Um, and in this case, right, when we run this script, we can select like a geolocation to run it from, and that's running through the checklist system, right? So if we have localization or other things that are going to affect by geo, what's what the result is going to be, we have the advantage of that network already. So this test was successful, right? Comes back as succeeded. We get a bunch of test steps that are coming back as here's what, what happened here. Um, and we also get even a little video. Now we don't capture these videos normally on successful uh, runs, right? For when we're running things automatically every minute, we're not necessarily going to get back that um, that video, but we will capture on an unsuccessful run. And of course we capture it when we're running it here in the uh, uh, editing mode, uh, right? For our first time. You can also see a trace of what's going on, including individual steps. And if you have like flashes of unformatted content or other kind of surprising behaviors, those will all get captured here. And you even can see the locator like finding this link. I know that's a little tiny. Uh, you can see the locator finding this link and clicking it. Okay, so that was generating our code, writing our first uh playwright test and next we're going to turn it into a monitor but before i i zoom along if there are other questions go ahead and uh drop them in the uh chat or hit a raised hand which i which i am set up to see yep uh and let me know if you have questions otherwise we will go on to turning going from this test into a regular uh synthetic monitor okay so let's go into uh, these settings and start creating a monitor from this single test. So um, first we're gonna look at scheduling and location. So in this case, this cadence that I have set actually may make a lot of sense that I wanna check a relatively obscure path in my documentation. And it may not be something that I'm constantly worried about is going up or down. But obviously if you have something like, hey, users can check out in your online storefront, right? You do not probably want to check it just every 12 hours. So you can set your cadence here for how frequently you want to be sending your um, checks, how often you want them to be run. And that's obviously going to affect like what kind of SLA you can support. So next is this question about parallel runs or round robin. And this is going to make a ton more sense once we have selected some locations here, right? In this case, we have five locations set. And parallel runs will say, hey, whatever cadence you set, let's say we set two minutes, parallel runs means, hey, every one of these locations is going to check every two minutes. Um, and that makes a ton of sense if we know that a lot of our failures are um, tied to a single geography and we want a very high SLA for that geography. But if we care a little bit about multiple locations, but we really just really we wanted to check the service every five minutes, every two minutes, what have you, then that's that round robin setting. So on a round robin setting, right, every five minutes, one of these locations is gonna run a check. And so that means each individual location is gonna go quite a little while, it's gonna go 25 minutes uh, between sending us a, a single check. So if you have seen before, you've seen, you know, serious failures in a single geographic region, um, it's worth thinking about setting that to parallel, but obviously this is just things you're in control of. Um, and then private locations, we're not going to cover. Uh, this is like an enterprise feature. If you're curious about that, if you're looking at this info here and you're like, oh, I'd like to talk about that, obviously get in touch with us. We'll happily demo that for you. So next is two really, really critical settings. And frankly, um, you know, uh, when you talk about something like Checkly on, or really any service on, you know, um, Hacker News or Reddit, somebody's going to say like, oh, I could, I could build this myself with a Raspberry Pi at $7. Well, you know, um, that's always a little bit of a silly response, but I think it's, it's uh, a, a critical differentiator of using a service to run your end-to-end -end tests as synthetic monitors is these these settings down here. Obviously, it's great to, to hit from multiple geographies and have those maintained and available all the time. That's really, really great. But then the other idea here is this retries and alerting. So in this case, you have these, you can say, hey, don't retry. And if you don't retry, right, you are 
increasing the number of alerts you're going to receive, right? Because you're saying, if you fail even once, go ahead and alert me. You can say, hey, fixed, being that uh, you're going to go ahead and retry, let's say, you know, um, five times. And they're each going to be 60 seconds apart, or four times in this case. You can say linear where um, you're, the length between each check is increasing linearly, right? So first it waits a minute, then it waits two minutes, then it waits three minutes, etc. cetera. Well, there's exponential. So we'd have to set up our like total duration or we'd have to set this down um, where the time between each check is increasing exponentially, right? So we have four retries, five seconds, 25 seconds, two minutes, five seconds, uh, et cetera. I think, I'm not sure that that last math is correct, but uh, the, the the gap is increasing exponentially. Now, why would you want to do that for your retries? Again, a retry is, right, you ran a check, it failed, you want to check it again, and uh, you want to count it as successful if it goes through, right, on, the, on that retry. So the reason for an exponential fall off generally is going to be that there is some danger that you're going to cause a problem with your check. So an example might be, a rare but expensive request that a user makes, e.g., like update all whatever records in my in my in my um, account, and we want to simulate that because we do want to know it's working. But maybe that takes maybe that kicks off a a background job that takes a few minutes to complete. So not great when when that runs successfully. That's fine, but when that it runs unsuccessfully, um, and then it fails, and so you try to get in a minute, and you try to get in a minute, but it takes 10 minutes for the process to complete, you're going to start to create like a spike in workload for yourself. So that would be a reason to maybe use an exponential back off where it's saying, hey, uh, come back in a little while, and then come back in a, a great deal larger amount of time um, for that retry. So let's go into alert settings here. So um, you very often want to just start with a global alert settings. Uh, but you can also do specific uh, uh, notification settings. This is going to make sense for our demonstration purposes. It's also going to make sense if maybe you're working on a small part of the site. Let's say you're working on like an intercom integration or a, a, you know in-panel chat or account info. Um, you're going to want to take a look here to say, hey, I want to um, be able to check this and make sure that this is working as expected. Um, and it's really only me who cares about this particular area. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and set these alert thresholds. So you can say how many times a failure uh, a check needs to fail before it generates an alert, how, or you can set a time window to say, hey, this has to fail for more than this long. Think about your cadence there, right? That's going to affect what makes sense here. Uh, where if it's five minutes, you know, um, then you only have it set to check every 10 minutes. So it's going to qualify for that every time it fails. Um, and then you can also set a percentage of locations as an and clause for that. And then you're going to see if you want to get a number of reminders for those alerts. So there is, of course, PagerDuty integration and other integrations with other very complex notification services. But you see here, there's a lot of depth here. Uh, including, I, I just got this the other day, like if we're not able to connect with you on a particular alert channel, if we get, for example, an email bounce, you'll get a notification of that as well. So really quite sophisticated and deep, which you're able to get back and see, hey, this is this is an issue um, for uh, the status on a particular check. Then you have our channels, right? You obviously have webhooks, uh, and and like I mentioned, like PagerDuty and other integrations. And these are covered on our doc site, what integrations are available. Okay, questions about turning a single test into this monitor with some cadence. I'm gonna go ahead and apply these settings. I'm gonna make one last change to our code. Okay, let's zoom along. So, Looking back at this check, I really start to notice that there are actually functionally two things going on here, right? I start by coming to this main page, then I go to the developer's dropdown, then I go, then I find the documentation, and then I check to see if I can edit the documentation. So, you know, it's it's fine to check multiple things. In fact, that's going to make sense to have multiple steps to most of our checks. We want to we want to automate something complex, but we'd like to get back detailed feedback, right? So. 
in this case, we could just have it start at this page, but really maybe that's not the best thing. If if the buttons to the documentation page are missing or not working correctly, then I want to know that too. But seeing as we are kind of checking two steps here, it would be nice to get feedback on the test that shows that. Right now, right, we just get whether or not the whole documentation contribution flow succeeds or fails with a bunch of kind of you know, de uh, trace information about how that executed. But let's add something human readable. And Jan has promised this is a little more on adding to some of the documentation around our test. So rather than creating separate documentation, writing comments, let's go ahead and add in code documentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate out these two steps into separate steps. So I'm going to do await test.step, and I'm going to name it something. Uh, in this case, navigate to the doc site. And I'm going to give it. A function. And so we're going to give it the steps that are involved in navigating to the doc site. And then. Do the same thing. Oh, my arrow, geez, Louise. I'm going to steal this line to create another step here. Okay. And I'll put this in here. So to really see this work, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and break this. Let's say um, instead of editing this page, I'm just going to say um, change this word. And so you know this step we would expect to. Oh, I got to name this this thing correctly. Whoops. So this is taking a little bit to complete because I broke one of the steps. So it's going to take just a minute more to uh, execute. It says, oh, that didn't work. Let's try that again with, with the thing properly named. So we have our two steps, navigate to the doc site and find the edit link. And yeah, so an unsuccessful test, right, takes a little bit longer to complete because it's looking on that page. It's waiting for that content to load. Uh, but it's not finding it. Well, let's take a look at this video, right? The video, we see things things are looking okay, right? And instead of just saying, hey, this whole overall test failed, we can say uh, one of the test steps failed. And see, so, yeah, it's finding the edit link. That's where we failed because the uh, navigating to the doc site worked just fine. So yeah, that's a um, one of the reasons that we would do steps to document our tests. Now, um, I'm just going to zoom in on this uh, text just a little bit. So there's a couple things I want to mention about this code. So the first thing is, right, I just said, hey, it's going to take it a little while because it's not seeing this component. Now, we did set an overall test timeout. But you'll see that there's you know this other amount of time, this five seconds that it waited to look for it. And you'll notice that we didn't wait at all. So let's look at that. Um, when we look at that test report, right, we see that there's this period where, you know, the, the page has a second of unformatted content, but it doesn't come back and say, oh, um, you know, the test failed because right at, you know, 0.02 milliseconds, there was no documentation page visible. So wouldn't we have to put into our code like waits to say, hey, wait five seconds, wait eight seconds, right? Well, there is a way to do that in Playwright. You'll see it's documented as, hey, maybe don't do this. It is implicitly brittle, right? To say, I'm going to have this exact wait time. That can shift around. You can, uh, you can outperform it for years and then suddenly start underperforming it. It's not very consistent. And if, for example, you add something like a loading graphic or other interstitial messages, right? Putting in a hard wait time is not really the right thing to do. So uh, Playwright does include auto-waiting by default, 
where it will just check to see once an element is loaded uh, where that item is. And so you do not have to put in manual weights by default. Another thing to be aware of is the way that playwright locators work by default. This is the, from the, the, the generated code. You have this get by role and button. So this again is a functional user-based locator, right? Which is trying to actually say what the user is going to see. So this is very different from trying to find it by its CSS class or by its color or by uh, its text content by default, right? If a user is using a screen reader, a mobile browser, uh, a text-based browser, whatever, whatever kind of thing, they're still going to see buttons rendered as buttons in whatever system they're in. So, so that's, you know, our, our role-based locator, which is the default for uh, Playwright. Then also you'll notice this, which is just this first clause, which you're going to see quite a bit, right? Um, uh, in auto-generated code and in your own code, as you say, hey, I have a button marked developers, there is another button marked developers on the page someplace. So we want to use that first clause to just say, hey, I, I want to just go ahead and access this one. Okay, so I'm going to get a quick drink of water and step into the next component, which is talking about um, API checks and then monitoring his code, going ahead and running and controlling our checks uh, from the IDE. Fantastic. All right. Let's get into it. So all of this has been a browser check. Um, which is a super useful way to, to emulate users' behavior on the uh, browser. But you can also create an API check. So API checks are built differently because they are less complex to, to host and run. Um, they look simple at the outset, right? They look like, again, like that sort of simple pinger we, we we talked about. And there are such things as heartbeat checks, which are really just hitting a single, you know, URL, uh, a single route, um, and just checking to see that we get a response. API checks have a little more depth than that, right? Because you are able to hit a URL, you are able to, to set um, the method that you want to use, but you can also set, right, body, heady, headers, you can set a query params, you can do authentication, you can run, set up, and tear down scripts, and you can add assertions for what you're expecting to get from that response. And so one of the concepts here is like a golden file that says you can say, hey, I want the response to look exactly like this golden file. And you have all the same le level of flexibility with how you set those checks and also what, what reports you get back. API checks are less expensive to run than browser checks. If we have questions about API, API checks, please go ahead and drop those in the chat and I'll um, rotate back to this. Uh, but yeah, a very, very powerful tool. Um, and again, very nice to be able to be very user centric and say, hey, this is what an actual path that I, that I would like to, to, to run. So one of the things to be aware of, this is something that is... Uh, we have some great documentation and blog posts on is that when we start creating a whole bunch of these alerts, we might start thinking about alert fatigue, that we're getting back too many responses back uh, in the negative. And so there is now this degraded status that's available both from, from playwright code and within Checkly to say, hey, this is not going to be listed as failing and may not generate failing alerts, but we will see as degraded status. So that's one of the ideas there is the idea that um, you might have something that's maybe not performing in the right speed. And that is worth being aware of, but it's not necessarily worth um, sending out our full like failing alert. So you'll see listed here. I don't have anything listed as degraded currently. I, I did try to get something into degraded status for a little bit, but I it uh, looks like it, it, it changed its performance uh, envelope. So it's no longer listed as degraded. But yeah, this degraded status lets us see, hey, um, we have something we want to look into, but it's not maybe worth getting out of bed over or that kind of thing. Okay, so let's dive into monitoring his code a little bit. So in our comfortable uh, IDE here, we would really like to keep our users here who are engineers and are comfortable with this environment. And we're going to get some other benefits as well from letting them stay in the system that they are comfortable in. So 
we have a little check here, which is just saying, hey, I want to go to the playwright.dev page where we talked about some of our great document, some of the great documentation is on the playwright framework. We want to expect that we're going to get a non-error response. And we're going to expect that the page will have a picker title. And after that, we want to take a screenshot of that page. Um, and this is a test that we, uh, you know, again, I showed us like copy and pasting back into the web interface previously. That's not something that we have to do. Um, we can, in this case, this is saved to our checks folder, right? Home, homepage of spec. And so we can do And we'll see down in our console that we're running a single check. Get back our response. And we can even load an interface here and look at this as a look at look at the results. But one of the things that's quite powerful here is that uh, rather than just running this from our laptop, like we could do with the Playwright CLI by default, again, this is able to use the Checklink network. So the checks that we run as we're developing our monitoring can be very, very nice and similar to, run in an exactly similar way to the checks that we're going to be running from uh, the monitoring system later. We don't say, oh, well, for my laptop, maybe I had this set up or maybe I was on the private network or what have you. We can just immediately run from the same Checkly network that we're used to. And this takes in the config. So then the other part that we saw the web interface was setting all this stuff out. Hey, where do we want to run it from? At what cadence? Uh, even what our notifications policies want to be. We can control all that with a config file. And not only can we configure that, but we can send this up to the Checkly system with just um, the command Checkly deploy. And that will push it up and it will be visible in our web interface. Now I've done this already, right? Uh, a couple of times I was practicing this. So sure enough, you know, our... Um, homepage spec shows up right here as part of this group. Um, and, you know, it is running, but then we can, we can you know, uh, work and continue to maintain a shared check and see the work that's happened on it, share that with everybody right from our command line. Now, I got a question on the really great Checkly Slack a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about monitoring as code where somebody asked me this, where they said, how do I make sure that my colleague doesn't deploy checks right as I'm making changes for my own deploy, right? So, and it was like, oh, it's time to go to the next level with monitoring as code. Like, it's great that you have on your laptop, like a bunch of code files and you're sharing that repository with somebody else and then you're hitting deploy, but it's like, oh, those can collide, right? That's, that's a concern. Well, so this is where we start to go into think about source control, right? That you can, instead of deploying from um, a uh, from your laptop and just say, okay, I'll push that up to the Checkly system. You can also say, hey, we're going to have a shared repository. We're going to merge and we're going to use something like GitHub Actions to say only when uh, you know PR is accepted and we merge, then do we deploy changes to all of our Checkly tests. There's other ways to do it, right? There's sort of lower scale ways to do it where you're just saying, hey, no, I just go ahead and hit deploy. I do hit deploy for my laptop, but only after we've we've gotten this you know approved PR to our to our main branch. So tying in with a CICD system or tying in with GitHub Actions really unlocks new stuff for us um, and really can, can unlock some, some superpowers that we should be aware of. And let's take a look at that. So I've got here some... Um, I've got here some uh, a, a YAML config for GitHub Actions to show you quite how deep this ability goes.
let's take a look here. So this is our config, um, our GitHub config for our GitHub actions. Sorry, it looks like I got a little bit of a Wi-Fi stutter there. Um, I think I think you're all able to, to, to hear me still. It looks like we're transmitting through. Uh, there is also a recording that will be made available after this, so apologies if you missed something and, and, and lost this piece. But looks like I'm in. Okay. So here we are configuring GitHub Actions, and this is just an example uh, piece, right? Um, I didn't cover... Um, environment variables, but one of the things to be aware of, right, is you can use environment variables to do authentication uh, so that you can simulate things like a user login without obviously having to commit code that contains even a demo user's login. Um, so that I was just reminded of that by seeing, of course, this uh, environment variable keys for uh, the check the API. But um, here's some of the powers that we have, right? We can use ifs to say, hey, we only want to run our checks when the deployment was successful. We'll run our checks on a particular platform. We'll detect a branch name and add that as part of our information on the, the check. And then we'll pass in an environment URL, right? Are we running on staging QA? What's our environment URL? And then um, we'll say, hey, if we we're on production and our tests were successful, then go ahead and deploy the checks that we were committing um, out to our Checkly account. So really powerful automation options um, with our uh, monitoring as code and integrations with, for example, GitHub Actions. These are fully documented on the um, uh, Checkly documentation site. And so, you can absolutely dive into integrating with your service. There's a ton of integrations listed there. Very, very powerful set of tools. Okay, so so here's another example config file. And I can make the stack available if you want. It's, it's a pretty limited stack. It's just sort of reminding me of stuff I wanted to talk about. But uh, yeah, if, if you would like it, let me know. I'll, I'll happily share it with you. Okay, last, uh, or not last big idea, but one of the next big ideas, and this is getting us a little bit further from our kind of user-centric or functional testing, right? Which is saying, hey, I, I as a user have this requirement, right? So this is visual regression monitoring. I have a couple examples of, of working visual regression monitors, but um, this is a nice, nice illustration of the problem. We're using this diff viewer to see, hey, this image has changed and it's even changed in size, and this is causing a failing test. Now, again, talking about how this, this breaks our kind of design principles a little bit, a user does not go on your site and say, hey, I noticed some pixels are moved, right? So this is um, a, a, a test that may be useful to you, a check that may have some value for you for a lot of reasons. There's a million reasons why we could have small visual changes that are worth noting. Um, and there's also reasons that like a visual change monitor is going to detect things that no functional change can detect as effectively. So it's worth doing. We just want to be aware that it is kind of taking us a little bit away from our design principles. I guess the, my point is, this is not a good first test. Like, go ahead and go ahead and set this up to check your site once you know that your login actions and other behaviors on your service are working well. So visual regression tests use the concept of a golden file. So when we run a test uh, with a visual regression monitor, we were prompt to create golden files. So when we say, hey, we want to compare this to a previous screenshot, right? Um, a really good question is, well, what screenshot, right, do you want to compare it to? When you first run it, you're not going to have one available. So um, you can say when you run it in the web UI or when you run it from the CLI that you want to create that screenshot to compare it to. You can also upload a golden file and say, hey, go ahead and compare it to this. Now, for API checks, where you're looking at a JSON object, it makes a ton of sense to upload and say, hey, here's the object that I want to compare it to. But... It, that may not be a good idea to do, right? To say, to match snapshot and then feed it this thing. Um, again, can make total sense that we're looking at text values or a JSON object, but with a screenshot, remember that rendering will be different on these different platforms. So really nice thing about using Checkly is that when you run the checks in the Checkly network, they will always have exactly the same rendering. And so the screenshots will match. But if you're running this in your laptop or in a, uh, some other kind of virtualized browser, right? They're not going to match exactly, right? Because rendering has some subtle differences. And then here's some ways that you can, uh, you know, here's how you can do that from the CLI. You can say, I want to run this test and I want to update those snapshots. 
Next, there's the idea of uh, emulation for mobile devices, which is coming up after um, visual regression, which makes some sense, right? Because uh, very commonly, we're thinking about visual changes looking with a particular type. So you can go ahead and define, you know, via user agent, hey, here's what my device is, and here's the, the size and orientation that I want to use. So defining a device creates a default viewport. So you want to set the viewport only after you destructure devices. And then right now, checklist supports only Chromium and Chrome browsers. Okay, we're getting to the end of time, but I wanted to check in with a few last checklist sort of big ideas. So the, the next is accessibility testing. So this is recently unlocked and I think really could do a lot to monitor whether we've introduced some regressions to accessibility. There's a, a blog post about this um, and a nice video demonstration as well. Um, to do accessibility monitoring with Checkly. Um, and then next is Checkly Traces. So we talked about, we had this diagram that showed, hey, here's the Checkly monitor coming in from the outside. There's going to be some basic questions about what's happening on the back end that we don't necessarily know, right? Like, do we? what is the particular database request that is launching so slowly? Then you can usually sync these up in time, and and the the key benefit of Checkly is telling you are you up or down for your users. Your users don't know right what your database connection status is, so it can make sense to 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 not care about that to really just care about this end to end testing. But if we want to go a little deeper, we want to try to connect those values. Checkly traces. Now I know we've created a pretty complicated uh, diagram at this point. So the idea here is that when we send a request. We can send in a request to your service and also add a header to it that will mark and connect that request with a trace that's happening on the back end. So this leverages the power of open telemetry. If you're running open telemetry traces, we can send a marker to make sure that, that this particular trace is marked as involving a Checkly Synthetics request. And then when that uh, Checkly Synthetics request initiated trace hits the open telemetry collector, you can send it off to us. And this allows you to connect your uh, Checkly trace with backend trace data and see, for example, you know, here was the exact request that was going out to the data store. Here's what was going to this microservice. Um, so very, very useful, really cool expansion. Uh, this is in beta now. Get in touch if you want to uh, really dive deep into this. Um, but uh, very, very neat and and you, coming to an account near you uh, very, very shortly. Now, if you want to go a little deeper on monitoring as code and get some of the best practices and techniques, there's a really good uh, pre-recorded masterclass with uh, Jonathan uh, Canales and, and Chris Cooney from CoreLogix. Um, very, very good. It's available via video. Um, it's available on our site. And I'll, if you're watching this recorded, there's a link down below the video as well. I'll get you a follow-up email after this session that will uh, get you the links that I talked about and other documentation.